It's Elisa Kraut, and I am going to do my presentation on cellulose acetate lamination. And if you haven't heard of it, um, after this presentation, you won't be able to say that anymore. Between the 1930s and the 1970s, American archivists and conservators basically went collectively insane and laminated millions of historic documents in plastic. Okay, that, that's an oversimplification. However, the bones of the statement are true. Between the 1930s and the 1970s, just need to say it again, millions of precious historic documents, estimates number the total to be upwards of 2.9 million, archivists, librarians, and conservators were told that this technique, cellulose acetate lamination, sometimes called barrow lamination, would protect fragile documents for decades or even centuries. Unfortunately, we now know that this is not true. In the intervening decades, the status of laminated materials ranged over a wide spectrum of performance. Some materials appeared to have held up well, while others have shown significant and sometimes irreversible deterioration. So how did we get here? <laughs> Take a minute and look at this really kind of bonkers picture from the Library of Congress. Their enthusiastic adoption of this technique no doubt contributed to its spread throughout the country in the 1930s and 40s. This is a photograph of Frances Benedict, and you can see that she they're all having a little bit of fun with the cellulose acetate film. Um, for a while, her name wasn't associated with the picture, but recently, over the last couple of years, I think, um, someone found out her name and added it to the caption of the picture, which is great. Uh, they were really thrilled about this. They started laminating documents with abandon. So how did this start? <clears throat> In the 1930s, William J. Barrow developed and popularized his cellulose acetate film lamination process, which became widely used around the country. The process was adopted by the National Archives around 1934 and became the go-to preservation technique for government and private archives that were wrestling with piles of degrading documents and real um, valid uncertainty about how to preserve them for the long term. Lamination was presented as a better alternative to a technique called silking, which was a, a technique that used thin silk gauze as a strengthening layer for the document. And it was attached by hand to the original document with a water soluble paste, like a starch paste or, or wheat paste, it varied. Unfortunately, the silk material started to decay and the repairs really only lasted two to three decades. So while coding an entire document in this manner may seem really drastic now, benefits to silking were that it was completely reversible with water and the treatment was safe to use on many materials. Over the next 10 to 15 years, um, after this technique was introduced, Barrow continued to experiment and improve this method. He added a deacidification bath to the original document. He added a tissue layer for additional strengthening and a deacidification step to the laminate film itself. However, materials and the techniques really varied by market and by the practitioner, which meant that some laminated documents um, were maybe vulnerable to less careful lamination, and that could be detrimental to the document's long-term health. The heat used to melt the film could be set at varying temperatures, meaning that some documents were laminated at a heat level that was high enough to age that substrate further, and the cellulose acetate films available were of varying qualities over time, different chemical makeups, and different states of acidity. Many of the documents that were laminated, especially during those er early years, did not go through this full um, multi-stage deacidification process before or during the lamination. 
and this left substrates and the ink, such as the highly acidic iron gall ink that was commonly used on documents through the 18th century, trapped in this airtight envelope of its own off-gassing, which could really push the document to decay at an accelerated rate. So as we've learned in this class, preservation issues in general are much more complicated than just simple reversibility. While silking, for example, is fully reversible, lamination is much more complicated and dangerous to the document since the laminating film melts into the substrate's fibers. So when a document is falling apart, is reversibility really as essential? And typically it might not be since reversing a repair would put the document back into danger. However, when repairs fail, as can be the case with cellulose acetate lamination, repair must be attempted if the document is to be recoverable. With cellulose acetate lamination, reversibility is not assured due to the variations in the technique and the changes in the chemical fabrication over the decades. Removing the melted in plastic can severely weaken an already very fragile document. And if the ink or the substrate is water soluble, then attempting to remove the coating can completely destroy the document that you're trying to save. Shown here to the right is a picture of um, a letter that's from George Washington to Moses Satius from the Hebrew congregation that eventually grew into the Toro Synagogue, the oldest synagogue in the United States. Um, in this, the initiating, in the initiating letter and this letter, Washington's response, Washington lists a number of statements that appear to show his support for religious freedom. And it's considered incredibly precious, especially to American Jewish history. Um, this was really my first time uh, being exposed to a laminated document when I was working at the National Museum of American Jewish History. Um, at some point in the past, I'm not sure when, I, I, I'm not, I have not uh, seen the conservation documents for this, doc, for this um, artifact, so bear, bear that in mind. But at some point in the past, it was laminated. Um, this image is not super high quality, but you can uh, possibly see sort of a, a, an additional edge on the left that might show you where that laminated edge is. Thus far, um, these letters, this letter and its companion, are actually in decent condition and their exposure to light is highly restricted. It's just allowed to be on display three months out of the year. In this case, this document may remain stable for years or even decades, but it's really hard to know. So far, the decision has been made not to attempt to reverse the lamination process. Here are some example, here's an example of a failed lamination. This is the South Carolina 1776 Constitution, one of a collection of South Carolinian constitutions that were treated by the Northeast Document Conservation Center. The laminate had failed and it was discolored and parts of the document were at risk of loss due to its already degraded nature. In this after picture, you can see that the pages look flatter and there's better contrast between the page and the text. So what do you do if you find laminated materials in your collection? That's a really good question. And considering how many millions of documents were laminated, um, it's really good to give this some thought and to educate yourself on the topic. By understanding the challenges posed in reversing and repairing failed laminated documents, we see the disappointing truth about cellulose acetate lamination. By its very nature, it's difficult to predict when or if the lamination will fail. But if it does fail, it can take your collections down with it. And because its use was so prevalent over 40 to 50 years, many repositories have this potentially volatile material on their shelves. The most important steps for collections care when laminating materials are identified is to maintain environmental stability. That really can't be stressed enough, and I don't think it's going to be a surprise to any of you in this class. 
uh, to ensure that the document has appropriate archival housing and to monitor for signs of degradation. Again, these, these uh, key indicators and steps are really nothing new. It's really what we've been talking about this whole semester, but it's important to stress because it really can mean the difference between losing a document completely and being able to save it. If a document's lamination is failing or, shows, or showing signs of damaging the document within, ideally, you should have a conservation specialist examine the document to identify whether it's a candidate for delamination. And alternatively and concurrently, digitization is an important tool in preserving documents before the damage goes too deep. questions and I'll also post those into the discussion channel. So I look forward to talking with you further about this in the chat. And then here are my sources. All right, see you in the discussion thread.